This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Go to the link in the description below so they know that I sent you. Hello everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and today I'm bringing you a bonus video. Every time I do a set review, I of course get some of the cards wrong. It just isn't possible to be perfect predicting how good or bad cards will be without ever playing the format. So after I've played a set a bunch, I like to go back and revisit the cards that I feel like I was wrong about and discuss what about the card made me be wrong about it in the first place. This time around, we've got 18 cards that I want to revisit. Let's start with white. First up, I have Impassioned Orator. I gave it a C-, and I don't think it's way better than that, but it's definitely better than that. You know, a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two is decent stats to begin with, and it turns out it can gain you a considerable amount of life. I've actually had a lot of games, especially against Ill-Gotten Inheritance, where Impassioned Orator really screwing up the race for my opponent by gaining me the extra life pretty much won me the game. It's also really nice against the more aggressive decks in the format, and in grindy matchups it's nice too because it's going to gain you more and more life as the game goes on. It just turns out it's really well positioned in this format, and it's certainly better than a C-. It still isn't something that, like, you know, I want to first pick, which would be something in the B range, but I think it's a C+. Plus. I think it's a solid playable, and you'll play, like, three or four of these and feel pretty all right about it as your two drop. Next, I have Resolute Watchdog, which I gave a D plus to. I just didn't think a one-mana 1-3 one who could make something indestructible would be that great, and this is a card that a lot of you told me I was wrong about. And in the end, I think I was wrong about it. I also don't think it's as good as some people thought it was going to be, where they said it would be first pickable and incredible. He's certainly not that, but he has a few things going for him. One of them is that the High Alert deck, which we'll get to later, is a very real deck in this format, in which case he becomes a 1-mana 3-3, three, three, and that certainly helps him. But it also turns out if you can leave 1-mana up, his effect to make things indestructible is pretty nice. He also blocks against a lot of creatures pretty well on the ground. He's not anything special, certainly, but a D-plus would mean you don't feel good about having him in your deck and you wish he wasn't in it, but I think the first copy of him is always fine, and I think that makes him a C. Next, I have Sky Tether, which I gave a C-minus to. I did say in my set review that this is the kind of spell that will be really, really good in a deck full of flyers, but if you're not in a flyer deck, it's not going to be all that great. And while it certainly is better in a deck with lots of flyers in it, it turns out it's good enough in this format, especially one where Gate Guardian and... Things like that can really run amok, and this is one of the few ways to really keep Gate Guardian from, you know, killing you, because if you kill it by conventional means, they could probably get it back with the Guild Gate, for example. But it also turns out that both Black White and Blue White are loaded up with Flyers. They're both basically Flyer decks, there's lots of good Flyers in both those color pairs, and Sky Tether, because of that, is good in both the decks that it could go into in this format, because those are the only two. And for that reason, I do think it's a C plus at least, and I may still be a little low on it. I could maybe see going B minus on it. It's still not going to be great all the time. Like sometimes there are times when it just doesn't matter that you have this. But if you knock a flyer out of the sky with it or stop a big creature from attacking you, well, that feels pretty good. All right, now let's move to blue. Where first up I have Fairy Duelist, which I gave a D plus to, which seems pretty absurd to me now. Basically, I just think I got this card completely wrong. I don't really think I have an excuse here. I think I was just flat wrong about the card. And this is another one where people said I would be wrong, and you guys were right again. It turns out that way, way frequently, you can play Fairy Duelist and get a card worth of value out of your opponent. You know, they attack with their 2-2. You have a 2-2 blocker of your own. You play Fairy Duelist, flash it in, and kill their creature with your blocker. Uh, there's lots of other scenarios where it can happen. The more blockers you have, the more chance you have maybe to take something down. Sometimes the duelist can kill things all on its own. It just turns out that this card is an amazing two drop and pretty much the best common two drop for blue decks at least in the entire format. And you run a lot of these and you feel pretty good about it. I don't, still don't think it's quite something that you first pick, but I do think it's a whole letter grade better. You know, a D plus means I don't want to play this, and a C plus means I feel pretty all right about having this in my deck, and certainly we've all been blown out by Fairy Duelist, and we've all blown people out with it, so it's, it's way better than I expected it to be. Next, I have Terramander, another low-costed flyer who I gave a D plus to. In this case, I don't think I was off quite as wildly, but I didn't think it would be very good because I imagined it would be really hard to get that adapt going. But it turns out it's really not that hard on turn 5 or 6 to adapt this and have it turn into a huge threat in the late game. Yeah, you're not going to abuse it like people can in constructed formats or anything, but you know, if you play this early, you attack with it a few times, and then you can adapt with it in the later game into your win condition, you're in pretty great shape. 
I still don't think it's incredible, certainly, but it's sort of like the Duelist in that it went from a card that I was saying, I don't really want to play this, to being a card I feel fine about having in my deck. And I do think in some decks it gets even better, decks that do have a lot of instants and sorceries. It can be a real threat, and I'm sure we've all lost games at this point to huge Terramanders. Next up we have Skitter Eel, another creature with Adapt that I underrated. As we'll see, almost every single card I'm wrong about on this list, except one I think I underrated, and I think that's generally true of me. I think I'm more pessimistic than I am optimistic. I don't overrate that many cards, but I underrate a considerable number, and that's what we're looking at here again. With Skitter Eel, I sort of looked at it as either a 4-mana 3-3 or a 7-mana 5-5, uh, five, five, which doesn't sound very good. But it's better than that. The fact that you can pay it over two installments, the fact that there are plus and plus one counter synergies, the fact you can do it at instant speed, leave up a counter spell, and be able to adapt if your opponent doesn't play into your counter spell, it just turns out that this is a solid little creature to have in your blue decks. It's certainly not something you're excited about having in your deck, but it's not a D plus. It's not a card you try to avoid putting in your deck. I think you run the first copy of this a significant percentage of the time. I think it's more like a C. Next, we have Thought Collapse, which I gave a D to. This is the second consecutive format where I underrated Counter Magic. I was kind of hoping it wouldn't be good again in this format because it can be frustrating, and I don't think it's quite as good in this format. We don't have Selesnya and Golgari to really prey upon who are playing these huge, curved creatures, high mana costs that you can counter and get a ton of value out of. But there's still some of that, and Thought Collapse is pretty playable. There's, you know, even Azorius or Orzhov or Esper decks, really. I guess can't be Orzhov, but there are decks that are control decks that can basically just rely on casting Thought Collapse a couple times to win the game. We've seen it happen. We've seen it happen at the Pro Tour, or Mythic Championship, rather. But either way, it turns out that this is a perfectly playable card, and I think you feel fine about the first copy in your deck all the time. You know, it's a cancel with a pretty minor effect, but that effect sometimes matters. But, you know, it's still not great, but it's definitely not a D. It's another one that I think has moved up to C. All right, now let's move to black, where we'll start with Plague White, which I gave a C- minus to. This is another one where I don't really think I have an excuse. I think I just really underrated the card. I think I compared it a little too much to Ornery Goblin, which was just like a C+, plus and was sort of the same thing. It was one in a red for a 2-1 goblin that when it attacked or blocked it did one to whatever it was in combat with and that was pretty great and i was like why doesn't this guy only do it when you attack why why doesn't he do it all the time but that kind of comparison is pretty useless clearly um it's you know mistake to make that comparison because it turns out plague white's pretty good it's a nice two drop for black decks you know i don't think i was hugely off on it or anything it doesn't get into the b range again it's not a card that has improved immensely but it's a card that's way better than i expected it to and it's probably the best black two drop it also fights well against the the fairy uh duelist which a lot of cards don't do in this format this low on the curve but yeah i think it's more like a c plus and you'll play uh you know a couple of these and feel pretty fine about it next up we have ill-gotten inheritance which i gave a d minus to so this is one that i was significantly wrong on i think However, I don't think I'm quite as high on it as some people are based on how many people I see jamming them into their deck in Magic Arena. In my set review, I said I didn't really think it would be worth it. It's a four mana do nothing enchantment initially, and that's true, and that is still a problem that the card has. But it turns out the fact that it immediately starts sort of screwing up the race, you know, causing two life of difference between you and your opponent every upkeep, that can rapidly change a game. And it turns out, especially in black-white, there are so many creatures with death touch and defensive creatures, you know, like our dog from earlier, that you can just play early, you can block for a long time and wait for your opponent to die to ill-gotten inheritance, and then in the later game you can, of course, have it do four to them, which can often just close out the game at that point. So I think it is a very, very legitimate win condition in a control deck. In my video I said I guess it could be a win condition if you're really hard up for one in a control deck. Uh, but it turns out that it's a perfectly fine one, even if you're not desperate for a win condition. I think it's a C. I will say, people are still overplaying this card by a ton. I've seen way too many aggro decks playing this. I've seen way too many decks that, like, curve out on turn four and play this, and they're too far behind to survive. You really have to have a nice, uh, mix of removal, defensive creatures, death touch creatures, value cards, you know, like, um, dead revels, all sorts of stuff like that. And then you can make Ilgotten Inheritance kind of ridiculous, uh, but I don't think it's the kind of card you should always be running in your black decks, I guess is what I'm saying. And I still don't think you should take it early. It's just a very solid win condition for black control decks. 
All right, now let's move to red, where first up we have Amplifier, who I gave a C- to. So what I didn't like here is that it's a four mana one one way too often. That is until your next turn, it's going to be a four mana one one, which gives your opponent all kinds of spells that can kill it. And then there's always a little gap between the beginning of your turn and your upkeep where it's a one one and lots of stuff can kill it. Or so I thought. There actually isn't that many things in this format that can kill it during that little window. They have to kill it when you play it basically uh, to be able to take it down. And when they do, that hurts. But a significant percentage of the time, this is just attacking as a 4-mana 5-5. Five, five. You know, I've had it be a 6-10 several times with, you know, the spider on it. Um, it's just a huge vanilla creature, so it's not anything special. But it's a legitimate threat that your opponent has to contend with, provided that it survives that whole first round of turns. It is still not like a premium rare. It's not a bomb. It's just a nice vanilla creature that I do think you take kind of early. I mean, I think it's like a C+. I think it's a nice card for red decks. I've been fine with it every time I've played it. I've never felt bad about it, even though I've had a few times my opponent kill it right away with, you know, a two mana spell and that doesn't feel very good. But most of the time you get enough value out of it that I think it's worth it. Next up, I have Gates Ablaze. And this is sort of an ongoing theme here. I was wrong. I underrated basically all the good gate payoffs. I did say in my set review, I think gate decks are going to be better in this format because the gate payoffs are better but I didn't make them better enough. So with Gates of Blaze, I gave it two grades. You know, I gave it a build around C and it's an, an F in a regular deck. And I do still think it's an F in a regular deck. Unlike some of the other gate cards that you can get away with playing the gate payoff if you only have two gates, Gates of Blaze, you can't play if you have two gates. So, you know, it's an F. The other problem it has is it's not that good in more aggressive decks. You want it in a control deck, which a lot of the best gates decks are, are anyway, but there are times where you can't play it, and I think that means that it's still an F, like in, a, in the majority of decks, when things don't work out with gates and things don't work out with your deck being a control deck. However, I think the ceiling is insane. I've had a lot of success with it. I've had people blow me out with it. I've seen stream, other streamers and people have success with it. I think it's more like an F uh, build around that's a B when things go right, and you know, I, it, I think that's about right. I think that even means that in a really weak pack, you can consider first picking it because it has a reasonable high ceiling. So on the topic of gates, let's move to green where we begin with Gatebreaker Ram. So I gave him a D in a normal deck and a C in a deck that really got there. And I was just, I was wrong. I mean, again, I underrated how good these gate payoffs could be. I think I was right that it is playable even in a deck with like two or three gates in it. But I think it's more playable in a deck with two or three gates in it than I thought. I think this thing can just take over games if you play it at the right stage of the game. Uh, frequently, you can play it on turn three as a 4-4, four, four, uh, and that's a pretty nice thing to have. It's already out of range of grotesque demise and the like. And oftentimes in the late game, it's just like a 6-6, six, 7-7. Six, seven, seven. You know, we've all had, we all have ridiculous Gatebreaker Ram stories where we've seen like a 12-12. Twelve, twelve. It happens. And because of that, I think it's actually like a C in your typical deck in the format that's going to get two or three gates. And then if you really get there on the gate deck, it's amazing. It's just going to win a lot of games for you. So I think it's also first pickable because it has a high ceiling and a reasonable floor. All right, next I have the one card, the one card that I think I overrated in the set, at least by a considerable amount, and that's Cerulee Caretaker, which for some reason I gave a C plus to. So my reasoning was I thought that this kind of fixing would be nice. It can ramp you rather quickly, but it turns out green just has better fixing in the forms of like open the gates and guild gates and the like. And that this asks you for some setup that is kind of a pain to necessarily have. I don't think it's unplayable or anything, but I think now in this format, you really only play the caretaker in a situation where you're desperate, where you're short on playables or you're desperate for fixing to play some sweet bomb you have. And anytime you're desperate to play, you're only gonna play a card when you're desperate. That means it's a D uh, and I gave it, I think it's a D plus now instead of a C plus. Sorry for anybody who played this early in the format because I gave it a C plus and we're really disappointed because I mean, I certainly was too. All right, now we're gonna to move to gold cards where first up we have high alert. So I gave this an F, you know, I knew it could be a build around, but I had this feeling that it just wasn't gonna work out. I, I kind of got hung up on the whole defender part and I was like, there's not enough defenders in this set for that to matter. And I do think that's mostly true. It's more often you die to your opponents having just high toughness creatures than you do their defenders when they play high alert. But it turns out the blue white decks just have a bunch of commons that they're gonna play anyway that have high toughness. 
you know, like the Night Arbiter and the Owl and all these creatures that just become insane when you get high alert into play. So obviously it's not just a straight F. It deserves a build around grade. I will say it doesn't work out in all decks either. You need to have enough creatures with high toughness to make it work in the first place. And you need to make sure you don't have creatures with more power than toughness, at least not a large number of them, because they're going to get significantly worse when you play high alert and that kind of defeats the purpose. So in the end, I do think it's a build around. I don't think it's one that you want to first pick most of the time, which means I think it's still an F in your typical deck, but it is a build around card that is worthy of at least a C plus when things go right. And obviously there are times where we've all just been destroyed by or destroyed someone with high alert, but your deck has to have sort of a perfect composition for that to work out. And that's just not always going to happen. And that's why I sort of shy away from wanting to first pick it as a build around. Next gold card is Captive Audience. Another card I just gave a straight up F2. I thought you should just never play this. And I think I was wrong. This card, I've seen some people list it as a bomb. I certainly don't think it's that. I think it's too slow for that. So the problem it has, and the reason I gave it an F, I mean, I think it still has those problems. They're just not as bad as I expected them to be. And that is that the turn you play this, you just paid seven mana to not really add to the board at all. Sure, your opponent has to do something on their upkeep, but they're going to choose something that doesn't really matter. And frequently, they're going to choose two things that don't really matter. It's really going to matter, you know, usually down to four or, or the five zombie creature tokens can make a difference. A lot of the times, discard your hand does nothing on turn seven and nothing in the late game. And your opponent can still add to the board after you've played this. You have to be at parity, and you can't really be at just barely at parity. You have to really be at a board stall or ahead of your opponent or captive audience still isn't very good. And that's why it's not a bomb. If you're behind your opponent when you play this, you're going to lose. You're going to be dead before they make the decision they have to make that's going to ruin the game for them. And there have even been games where I've seen someone do all three of these and be perfectly fine with it. If the game is in such a state that this can't do anything, and, and I think it is frequently because either it doesn't do anything, your opponent can pick all three and it doesn't matter, or it's too slow to actually get to the point where it kills them because you're only playing it in the late game. All that said, I don't think it's an F. I think it's a perfectly fine card to run like at the top of your curve as kind of a finisher. It doesn't help either by the way that you can play final payment and sacrifice the captive audience because technically you control it. So that also is sort of a, a scary thing that can happen with the card. I do think it's perfectly solid though. I think it's a C. I don't think it's a bomb. I don't think it's anything insane, but I think it's a solid playable, which is a considerable, you know, that's two letter grades higher than I gave it. That's still a huge increase, but I don't want to overstate how much better it is than I thought it was. It's just an okay card now instead of a terrible one. All right, next I have Shark to Crab, a card that I love a lot. One of my favorite cards in this format. And from the beginning, I thought it would be really good. I said you can first pick it in a lot of packs. It's a B minus, but uh, it's even better than that. It's considerably better than that. It is better than most of the rares in the format, most of the mythic rares in the format. It and Mortify are the two best uncommons in the format. I still think I would take Mortify over Shark to Crab, but it's close. I've seen people argue the other way. But the fact that this dude is a four man of four, four, great stats, also has a ridiculous ability where he can get larger and tap something down. And oh, by the way, if you have ways of putting counters on him other ways, like with your Guild Mage or Simic Ascendancy or any of that, things get completely ridiculous because you can just tap things down every turn. They're locked down for a whole turn. The crab is big, it bashes into your opponent. And all of that for me means that it's not just a B mine, it's not just like a like a barely first pickable card. It is a very highly first pickable card that I'm willing to give a B plus to. And I could even maybe see an argument here going all the way to A minus. It's that good of an uncommon. It's hard to pass it. It's a great one and I usually don't pass it when I see it pack one, pick one. Next we have Ethereal Absolution which is another card that I thought would be really, really good. I said it was a B plus that made it, you know, one of the top 20 or so cards in the format, but it's even better than I expected it to be. I think again, I was sort of worried about this idea of playing a six mana enchantment that didn't seem like it would do a ton. I mean, even in my review for the card, I do say, well, I mean, it does do something because immediately it weakens your opponent's creatures and makes yours bigger, but I was still worried about this idea. And I don't really know why I was, frankly. I mean, Everything about the card that's great, I said in my set review, you know, it makes tokens itself. Those tokens are going to be two twos. I said everything that this card does. I guess I just didn't fully comprehend how powerful all of it would be together. And it is insanely powerful. It is the biggest bomb in the format. And that means it's not just a B plus, it's an A plus. There really isn't any other card in the format. You should take over it, pack one, pick one. I can't think of anything. 
And if you see it pack two or even pack three, it's so powerful that sometimes you gotta consider throwing away what you're doing and trying to jam Ethereal Absolution into your deck. That's just how good it is. All right now we're moving to the last card, which is an artifact. And that is, of course, Gate Colossus. Another gate build around that I underrated. I thought it would be an F in a deck, like your typical deck in the format. And I thought it would be a C plus in a deck that really got there. Again, I thought these gate payoffs would be worth it. I just don't, don't think I comprehended just how good they would be. They're not just worth it. They're like worth really making your deck work for because they're so powerful. In the end, Gate Colossus is playable even in a deck with two or three gates because if he costs six or seven, like you're still getting a pretty good deal. He's hard to block and he's going to come back. Granted, ideally you have multiple gates, you know, five or more because then you can play gates and get him back. And that's what's really a pain because your opponent usually has to find some creative way of killing Gate Colossus. And then after they do, uh, you can just get it back from your graveyard on top of your library. In the end, I think Gate Colossus is like a C plus in your average deck in the format where you get like two gates. And I think it's an A minus in a deck that really gets there on gates. It's just a, it's a bomb in those decks. Um, and I don't say that about a lot of uncommons. I mean, I guess Shark to Crabs in that conversation as well. But Gate Colossus is an incredibly strong uncommon. And come to think of it, it's probably also in the conversation with Mortify and Shark to Crab. All three of them have some sort of build around requirements. You know, two of them want you to be two colors and this one wants you to grab gates. Anyway, that does it for this video. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of my limited content, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.